Am I going to get to wear shorts at church today as I preach? Maybe. I put on shorts and I was like, I can't pull off this look today. It just, you know, I, I have oddly hairy legs. I'll get over it someday. But then again, summer's almost over. You might not have to deal with it. But if it makes you feel better, hopefully me looking a little more laid back today makes you feel comfortable in knowing that wherever you are, we can approach the throne of grace, approach our God. Um, and that's kind of the point of all of this. We don't have to pretend to be more put together than we actually are. So maybe the shorts would have been a good idea. But if not, maybe you can uh, deal with me wearing a gray shirt that I'm eventually going to sweat through. So <laughs> let's do that. A um, couple quick announcements. Um, we've been praying through a couple things. I talked with some of our elders and our board of trustees last week uh, about specific needs in our church for the for the rest of the duration of Pastor Sam's sabbatical as I am acting as as lead pastor in ICF we brought up the need for somebody to handle youth ministry until the end of the year maybe until after our my child is born <laughs> because that'll be after that. Uh, and I was just honest with the fact that I won't be able to preach as often on a Sunday if I had to handle youth ministry at the same time. So we brought up the need, uh, we talked it out, and we came to the decision that we'd look for somebody. And after looking around, uh, we, I looked and talked to a couple different people, and hopefully I'll get to introduce the person that we eventually landed on. I don't want to spoil it. I don't know why it matters if I spoil it. A lot of people here don't, don't know him anyway. But there will just be a Sunday where randomly a new guy is here. And we look forward to you guys meeting him. He's somebody that I've grown to love. So if you would join with me now. Let's open up our Bibles. Let's read our main text and as we finish this particular journey of our series on the resurrection and how it changes everything, I feel like after this we can take a little bit of a breath before our next series, but today I think we're coming to some good conclusions. And even before getting to my sermon, I want to say it's been awesome journeying with you guys through this. You guys have been really encouraging to me, and it's been awesome to see how you guys have been wrestling through this as I have been, because it's been tough in the best way possible. So let's read our text. We're looking at Matthew. Open up to the book of Matthew. We're looking at chapter 28, and we're reading verses 16 through 20. Feel free to read along. If uh, I'll be reading from the ESV. Feel free to read along in whatever version you have. So we'll read through this, we'll pray, and we'll talk it out and chew on it together. So here the word of the Lord says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray one more time because we can't overpray. Let's. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for giving us this time together because we know something special happens when people who worship you from Monday through Saturday come together and worship you corporately. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would move, that you would fill us, and that we would dare to follow you. We even pray that you would bless us as we go through text. If it's, te if it's scripture in the Bible that we've read before, remind us that your word is alive. And bless us with new eyes because there's no end to you in what we could learn from scripture. There's no end to the satisfaction and joy we can experience in you as well, God. So speak to us. Speak through me. Don't let me speak on myself because I don't have enough 
to speak about you on my own. If I try to speak on my own, God, let those things fall to the ground. But Lord, as you speak through me, continue to work in my heart, continue to stir within all of us. Let us fall deeper in love with you and also push us to move at the same time. We love you so much, God. All these things we pray in your son, Jesus. Amen. So to recap the past couple sermons we've been journeying through together, our main theme for, for these past couple have been about the resurrection. And I've been saying this tagline for a while where I've said, the resurrection is bigger than we've come to know. The problem is a lot of times as Christians, we assume to know things and we assume that we've, that we've gotten everything from this doctrinal truth. We assume that the resurrection is nothing more. And I say that with quotes because we tend to downplay how big it is as if the resurrection was just part of the God story where yes, God sent his son Jesus and within the context of the big story of the gospel, it's a huge part. So he sent his son Jesus to live as a man. God literally lowered himself onto our level to live without blemish, without sin, and then took our sin upon him and died on the cross, died a sinner's death, one that was hugely embarrassing because he was mocked, he was betrayed. But not only did he take our sins in a loving manner to the cross, because in one way that would be an act of affection, an act of love. But the act of God is when he rose from the dead three days later. Because when he resurrected, he died and came back to life. And in doing so, effectively killed the consequences of our sin. No longer does sin and the grave have the power that it had when we were forced to live under the law. That's what he saved us from. And sometimes we think about our lives as Christians. We think about doctrinal truths. We think about things like the resurrection. And we assume we know everything. And we go about our Christian lives. And what I'm saying is there's so much more depth to this than we realize. If we were willing to go deeper we'd experience that depth and we'd experience an increased amount of joy. So it's worth getting to know more. So over the past couple of weeks, the first thing that we came to conclude was that when it comes to the resurrection, because the gospel makes some huge, audacious claims, some that are pretty far-fetched, we are saying that doubts are inevitable. And we're saying in some sense, that's, that's okay. Because your doubts are welcome. God welcomes your doubts because you having doubts about him does not change the fact that he is truth. And when we pin up our doubts against the truth that we seek in the Lord, the big truths about who he is easily eclipse our doubts over time. So your doubts are welcome. Bring them to the table of conversation with us. Realize that this place, church, was never meant to be a building that was a hotel for saints, for people who just wanted to present themselves as ones who wanted to be perceived as good and put together. Instead, this was always meant to be a hospital for sinners, for the broken, a place where you could find refuge, a place where you could find comfort, a place where you can be equipped to move as you get built up. So, yeah, your doubts are welcome. And from there, we also looked at how the big story of the gospel comes into focus on Jesus. We talked about how we as humans are always going to come to a fault. Because if worship is both seeing glory and giving glory, we always focus on the wrong thing at some point. But Jesus comes through in a way that we never could with his radical obedience. And ultimately, his radical obedience to the Father was when he willingly went to the cross, though it was hard. He even said, God, if it's within you, could you please remove this cup? And when he was in the garden at Gethsemane, he said, remove this cup. And he was under so much physical stress because of the notion of dying that he literally uh, sweat blood. 
You can imagine the toll that his body was taking. And he said, Lord, would you remove this cup? But his final prayer was, at the end of the day, your will be done, not mine. Radical obedience. And then from there, we looked at how within the resurrection, um, we have to take this leap of faith. Sorry, I lost myself as I thought about how awesome that Indiana Jones clip was last week. It was so good. I just thought about it. I replayed it in my head where he he stepped and boom, bridge. Faith is never going to be easy. At some point, faith is always going to feel like a leap. I brought up the illustration of how me, being a large man, I have to exercise a certain amount of faith every time I sit in a chair. Where basically, I have to believe that this chair isn't going to buckle and turn into kindling when I sit on it, you know? Um, but remind, I want to remind you of this. Faith isn't always going to be easy. But my, the, my faith is not found when I merely believe that the chair is going to hold me up. Faith is a verb. Faith is an action. And even though I'm going to have my doubts about this chair, eventually my faith is exercised when I choose to sit in it. It's an action. The same is true about our beliefs about God. We were not just here to think good thoughts about God, think good thoughts about each other. This is one of the main things we also talked with each other when some of us went away to family camp. We weren't meant to just feel these thoughts of unity with God and each other, but instead, it was always meant to move into action. So for me, my ultimate action of faith about a chair holding me up is though I have my doubts about it, I'm eventually going to sit down in it. The same will be true about our, about our faith in the Lord, about what we believe about uh, when it comes to Christ's death and resurrection. Today we ask, so what? Where do we go from here? From the beginning, what we'll notice is, like I said, in our main text, even the disciples, after Christ had, had died, had, had risen again, it says that some worshipped him, but some doubted. As we move on, I'm going to bring up the line that we said every week. The resurrection is bigger than we've ever known. The resurrection changed everything. So our focus today is, so what? What's new? So when it comes to this resurrection newness, the first thing that we're going to focus on, if you want to take a couple notes, um, the first big change was that because of the resurrection in Jesus, we have a new authority. A new authority. If you could turn your Bibles with me, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through 20. Here, the Apostle Paul is echoing the fact that we, are, we have this new authority under Jesus and that Jesus made these audacious claims where he said in our main text, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Paul says something about this in verses 17 through 20 in Colossians chapter 1. Here he says, and he... He referring to Christ. And he is therefore all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body. The church. He is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to do well. And pleased to dwell. And through him. To reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by blood of his cross. He is everything. And the point that we're trying to make here is that when Christ says, all authority has been given to me. He's saying, whatever way you're trying to live your life, follow me. Because... Christ is being honest about the truth that we're all following something. Whatever you're chasing after, you're, you don't just chase after with your, with your own desires. Even your own desires is something that you're following. Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about this life where he basically says, 
It's as if we're running this race. But the Christian life, you actually get to run this race and, and get a prize worth winning. He's like thinking about the, the fact that when people do the Olympics, they're running a race, they're beating their bodies, and all they get is this wooden wreath to wear upon their heads, and they get a sense of pride. But at the end of the day, this is much more worthwhile. Why don't we follow something better? The scope of Jesus' authority has no boundaries. And if we think about it, that's exactly what happened when Christ called his disciples. And follow with me, if you may, because this relates to us in, the, in, in a similar manner. When Christ initially approached his disciples, there were a bunch of fishermen casting their nets, catching nothing. And he approaches them and he says, why don't you cast your nets on the other side? And they basically go on this rant saying, you know, we're experienced fishermen. We've been studying this trade for a long time. But since they've been doing this the whole time, even though casting it on the other side of the boat shouldn't have made any difference at all, they did it anyway. And fish were coming up in a way that the nets were breaking. They knew this was supernatural. So when they eventually spoke, Jesus said, follow me and you'll become fishers of men. He said, follow me. What's awesome about the story when, when Christ calls his disciples was we tend to miss the fact that Christ is becoming their new rabbi. If you don't know what it's like for anybody growing up ethnically Jewish at the time, basically every single boy, no matter who you are, no matter how you're growing up, you're, all, you're studying under a rabbi to become a rabbi. And a big part of this has to do with you have to study the first five books of the Old Testament, cover to cover, word by word. And eventually when you become a teenager, you are tested and you are weighed to see if you're going to continue studying to become a rabbi. And eventually... If you don't continue on, if you're not deemed worthy enough to continue in your studies to become a rabbi, you then go into the trade of your father. What does this mean? Jesus' disciples, as people who were fishermen at this point, were people who failed at something they were supposed to chase after. They were fishermen because there was a need for fish, but also because they were essentially rejects. They weren't good enough, so then they followed the trade of their, of their father. And they just assumed that, okay, from here on out, this is the natural order of things. My father is a fisherman. I am the son of a fisherman who didn't measure up. So I, in turn, am becoming a fisherman, and I will probably birth a fisherman's son as well. Then comes Jesus saying, follow me, becoming their rabbi. And in doing so, Christ gave these fishermen a way to become more than they were meant to be on their own. We in turn are given that same opportunity. Everything about us, who we are naturally, was meant to go in a specific direction. When it comes to this life, we were meant to run in circles until we die. And after we die, we were supposed to be dead for eternity in our transgressions. But because of Jesus, we have a hope to become more than we were meant to be on our own. Don't miss out on that. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, follow me. And that's what we have in this new authority in Christ. We have an authority over us without boundaries. And because he has no boundaries, as we willfully submit to him, we have no boundaries. Within this new authority as well, what's awesome is that Jesus gave these adventurous commands as to how we are meant to live, live and serve under Christ's lordship. So if you'd go with me through this for a bit, that'd be cool. So under the authority of Jesus, see the beauty in these things. One, we are called to be in community. In community with God and in community with each other. What does this mean? This means that under the authority of God, we are meant to live shared lives. 
We are meant to these relationships where we dare to be vulnerable enough to bear ourselves, to risk being known, to experience the ups and downs 